Hi, everyone, and welcome to Murder and Merlot. We are a true crime book club podcast. I'm your host, Tara. And I'm your host, Michelle. How's it going, Michelle? It's going really well. I'm very tired, but it's going really well. (laughs) I think we're both surviving, not thriving right now, but we're going to get through it. Yeah. Just had a busy week. It's crazy. So Nice. Well, yeah. I'm going to tell you about some true crime stuff, and I feel like it's going to be a really good end to your week. I can't wait. I can't wait at all. Yeah. I can't wait to be in the driver's seat once again and tell you about a couple of fascinating cases. Today, we're going to be discussing one of the many serial killers from California. And this episode, we're going to be discussing the trailside killer. So it's going to be super fun. Mm Mm-hmm. I feel like 80% of serial killers and cults and stuff come from California. So I just want to ask, like, what is in the water there? Like, do you feel like that too? (laughs) I do. I feel like there's some like weird vortex in like California and Florida. And I I don't know if it's because of like the Disneyland and worlds are down there. So more weird people flock there. I don't know. Maybe that's Or if it's just like, it's hot and it's sunny and again, Maybe serial killers don't like to be cold. I don't. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe we should do a. <laughs> but study I've totally on that. thought about that. Yeah, could be that they're just very heavily populated areas. But I like the theory that serial killers don't like to be cold. I. You know. <laughs> I. But that. Okay. So, but I don't like to be cold, and I want to put it out there. I am not. A <laughs> Same. Good point. <laughs> you hate the cold. <laughs> there is no correlation, though. The, no. Mm-mm. No. <laughs> I've been to California one time and I legitimately almost got stabbed. What? And yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I've told you that story before, but I feel like I want to tell that story on today's episode. But I'll, you know what? I'm going to tell it at the end, at the end of my story. Oh, man. I'm and then know. everybody's got to wait around to find out how I almost died. <laughs> If I got to wait, you bitches got to wait. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. So stick around. It'll be worth it. Well, if it's as good as your bear story, I mean, I mean, my bear story is like, it's pretty great. It's kind of what I'm known for, but yeah, this is also a really fun story that I I feel like I should tell more often because it makes me laugh. Hey, (laughs) I almost got stabbed. It was really fun. Yeah. Not usually what you think is going to happen. Well, I mean, as long as I didn't actually get stabbed, it's fine. It's it's funny to look back on because I didn't get stabbed. Okay, okay. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Sitting on the edge of my seat waiting for that one. (laughs) Perfect. All right. Well, I also wanted to bring up um, my table saw slash circular saw correction from the last (laughs) mini-sode. I did explain myself when I posted on our socials about our mini-sode episode release. But I just want to say, the article I was reading threw me off because they pictured a table saw on the article. It was definitely not your fault. (laughs) But they were talking about a circular saw. And I do know my saws, but when there is a picture of a saw in front of me, that's what I'm going to picture for the story. So when I'm talking about, you know, you don't use a circular saw on trees. I was literally in my mind imagining picking up a table saw and putting it on a tree. (laughs) I'm like, that is not how that works. So was I, but that's because that picture was on the article. It was the picture's fault. It was not entirely my fault. I still don't think it's the best idea to use a circular saw to trim a tree. I, there's tools for that. Or to cut off any limbs, but anyways. Mm, Also, now I'm not 100% confident about like where I said the wrist cut was. Because I feel like it's, I don't know. I don't think like above or below the wrist is a very good explanation of anatomy. They should use like distal and proximal. And I would like, you know, understand. But I feel like anybody can interpret that differently. So I was very confident at the time. But now I'm like, well, I was wrong about the table saw. So now I'm probably wrong about that too. So eh. Well, in my head, she sliced her hand off between her ulna and her radia. And Mm -hmm. ulna and radius. I know my anatomy. I swear to God, I do. (laughs) (laughs) You're only, you know, a a vet tech. What do you know? (laughs) 15 years in the industry and, you know, many anatomy classes under my belt. (laughs) But it's fine. (laughs) It's fine. Anyways, anyways, we should continue on. (laughs) Moving on. (laughs) 
So we finished up our labyrinth series, which was super fun. I thoroughly so fun. enjoyed it. Hopefully everybody yes, else did as good. well. The only feedback I got back was from my mom and she didn't read the book, but all of a sudden she called me the one night and she goes, Michelle. I was like, what? She's like, I found this artist. It came up on my Facebook and he's from Edmonton and he does these drawings and he, he drew Biggie. And I'm like, immediately my brain went to how the fuck did he know who big fella is? Right? Like my cat. <laughs> yeah. And That's then I was like, where my brain would go to. I was like, wait a second. Did my mom just say Biggie as in referring to the notorious B I G? <laughs> Ooh, mama. She's like, hip okay. now. She's hip. She's hip. It's cool. So yes, she did find this amazing artist from Edmonton and he does like crazy, like charcoal drawings and Ooh, there's like Snoop Dogg and Biggie Smalls and like he does animals. And, yeah, it was very yeah. cool, but. Oh, that's like, excellent. <laughs> I loved it. That's hilarious. Oh, she's so cute. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Yes. And in case you missed our Labyrinth Book Club episode, we did briefly discuss Halloween and what our costumes were, but in case you missed it, we wanted to, you know, go over our Halloween questions again because, you know, it's got to do with our fluff and stuff question. Right, so, naturally. What were you, Michelle? <laughs> I was a witch. I was the most fabulous witch in our town. It was great. You make such a good witch. Like, I just loved that look. Oh my God, I had so much fun. And I was like trick-or-treating uptown with my kids. And I had like people stopping me on the street being like, I didn't know we had witches living here. And I was like... <laughs> Well, yeah. you do. Yeah. You do. Yes. And honest to God, I would wear that outfit every day because I just loved it so much. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to give up the hat. No. It's actually sitting on the shelf behind us right there. You so cute. It. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, for work, I was also a witch, but I was a witch from Hocus Pocus. Was she was Sarah. Sarah Sanderson. Yes, I was. She was adorable. Yeah, to wear a terrible blonde wig, but it was fun. And then um, for actual Halloween, I was a Manson family murderer. <laughs> so I was well on hippie, but I was drenched like head to toe in blood. So yeah, I liked it. it was great. I loved it a lot. <laughs> great. I did give her shit though, because I was like, did you take some of the fake blood and write Helter Skelter on the wall? <laughs> like at the party? <laughs> and I was so mad because I was driving when she said that and I was like damn it I did it and I didn't bring any extra fake blood to the party <laughs> so I damn was very it. disappointed with myself yes but anyways the reason why I brought that up is because the last um fluff and stuff question was what are you dressing up as for Halloween <laughs> so we wanted to shout out some of our favorite responses for that on Facebook Cade shared I'm a teacher and all of us are using carts to go to each class rather than having kids move from room to room. A bunch of us are dressing up as Mario characters to do Mario Kart. And I friggin' love that. So and I cute. Hope, I hope somebody threw a blue turtle shell down a school hallway. I'm just saying. That would be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Great idea. I, I love that. So original. I love it. I feel like there'd be so many shenanigans too. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. I could get into a lot of trouble dressing up as Mario Kart. <laughs> oh, me too. Yeah. Just have like bananas and just throwing them at people. <laughs> just whipping them. Not even like the peel, like the whole banana. Just the whole banana. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and my favorite response came from Angela on our Instagram. All she said was, quote, a carpet, <laughs> which I thought was just hilarious. And it made a lot more sense when I saw that her significant other was dressed as Aladdin. I was like, oh. oh. Okay. <laughs> and then I just loved that she decided she wanted to be the carpet rather than dressing up as Jasmine. You know, that would make too much sense. It's like perfection. 10 out of 10, best costume this year. And it was adorable. Tara sent me a Snapchat of that night and there's a picture of a Manson girl and a carpet with a head, and it was amazing, and I loved it. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it was a, a lovely picture of us. It was great. It was awesome. <laughs> uh, good times, good times. Good times. All right. I think that's all we have for our intro. 
don't think so. All right, friends, grab your glass and get cozy. Let's talk about murder. Ding! All right. Let's do this thing. Let's get it. So for our book club, we are currently reading Mindhunter, Inside the FBI's Elite Serial Crime Unit by John Douglas and Mark Allshaker. And if you're not reading along with us, that is fine. Don't run away. You don't need to read the books in order to listen to the podcast. Although this book is incredible and I highly recommend it. But we will talk more about the book itself in our book club episode. But for my full episodes, I've decided to take two of the cases that have been mentioned in Mindhunter and we're going to take a deeper dive into them. And I'm excited because from what Michelle knows about this case is very little compared to what I put in here because in the book, it's only like five pages. But yeah, I have a whole bunch of information here. Oh, I'm so excited. Yeah. Today's episode was inspired by chapter eight of the book titled, The Killer Will Have a Speech Impediment, which I thought was like, ooh, so exciting. I love that. It starts on August 19th, 1979, when 44-year-old Edda Kane decided she wanted to go for a hike. She wasn't able to find anyone to join her that Sunday, but she decided to go anyways. She chose to hike up the east peak of Mount Tamalpais, which is a beautiful mountain that overlooks the Golden Gate Bridge and the San Francisco Bay. It is also known as the Sleeping Lady, or as many locals just call it Mount Tam, which is how I will be referring to it in this story. Yeah, that's the only way I know it, Mount Tam. Yeah, it's more simple because I probably pronounced it wrong. (laughs) (laughs) Because I'm great at words. It's fine. I just, you know, have a podcast. I don't need to be good at words. That'd you don't crazy. have to speak well. Right? What? <laughs> Etta lived an athletic lifestyle, was a bank executive, and was married. When she did not return home later that day, her worried husband contacted the police. They sent out a team that night to look for her, which included search and rescue dogs. All they had found, however, was her car sitting untouched in the parking lot. The search continued the next day this time with more results. Unfortunately, though, they were not the results everyone had hoped for. She was found that afternoon by one of the dogs, but she was dead. She was naked, except for just one sock, and she was face down in a kneeling position. It appeared as though she had been begging for her life. It is possible that her killer had forced her to do this to make her subservient to him. The cause of death was a single bullet to the back of the head. There had been no evidence of sexual assault. Taken from her were three credit cards and $10 cash, although her wedding ring and her other jewelry had been left behind. The autopsy determined that the gun used in the murders was a 44 caliber and that she had been shot execution style. There was very little evidence to go off of, and with there being no signs of rape, the motive was unclear. No one that knew Etta could think of anyone that would want to hurt her or why anyone would do this. The day of the murder, a witness described two suspicious men to police that they had seen in the area. The first man was blonde and he had been acting strange, and the other was wearing a dark blue jacket that was apparently making him sweat, and he used it to hide his face. It was estimated that this man was about 35 years old. These men were never identified or confirmed that they had anything to do with the murder, so the case was left unsolved for quite some time. Those that used the hiking trails in the area were shaken up at first but eventually the nerves settled and things returned back to normal. It was thought that this was just a random, single homicide, but that was certainly not the case. This became apparent when six months later, tragedy struck again in the same park. It was March 8, 1980, when the body of Barbara Schwartz was found in Mount Tam. There were some similarities to Edda's murder, such as the location, the surprise attack on a lone hiker, and she too was in a kneeling position but there were some differences as well. Instead of being shot, Barbara had been stabbed repeatedly in the chest. There was also an eyewitness. A female hiker watched through the trees as Barbara, a 23-year-old baker, and her dog were approached by a thin, athletic man. She was stunned when the man suddenly began to stab the woman in the chest for nearly a whole minute. Barbara fell to the ground, and the witness ran for help. What could you imagine? No. Mm -mm. Oh my God. Terrifying. And then you're running away like, oh my God, did they see me? Are they following me? Terrifying. Right? Along with the eyewitness account, investigators also found some physical evidence at the scene. 
So at this point, the probability of solving the case seemed more promising than the last. Unfortunately, things didn't go quite as planned. For starters, the witness described the perpetrator to be about 25 years old, with a hawk nose, dark hair, and was wearing hiking boots. This would later be proven to be an inaccurate description, and it misled the investigation for quite some time. Others that were on the trail the same day reported seeing an older man, in his 40s, wearing glasses and a raincoat, even though it was not raining. At the time, there would have been no way of knowing, but this lone hiker was much more likely to be the killer. Who goes for a hike in a raincoat? Yeah, that's very suspicious. Like, if you see that, jot it down, <laughs> especially if it's right, like, a hot, sunny day. <laughs> Right, and that's like the the guy that was covering his face with his with the coat jacket in the first yeah. one. Like, is it the same guy? I feel like it was, but they don't know yeah. for sure. But talk huh. about suspicious. Yeah. <laughs> Why you not want me to see your face? Yes, mm-hmm. on a hiking trail, <laughs> right? When murders are happening. Hmm. Right. <laughs> Interesting. A few days after the attack, a bloody boning knife was found by some kids nearby. It matched the weapon the pathologist determined caused Barbara's injuries after he had examined them. He estimated that a 10-inch knife was used in the 12 stab wounds he found in her chest. Unfortunately, a TV reporter got to the evidence before the police did. They had handled the knife, which obviously (laughs) destroyed any possibility of retrieving fingerprints from the weapon. What a freaking bozo! (laughs) Seriously. (laughs) Makes me so mad. (laughs) and i don't know why i chose bozo as my insult today but that's what came to my head i'm with you i yep bozo Mm -hmm. yep bozo (sighs) there was one more piece of evidence found at the crime scene the day of the murder and it was a pair of blood-stained bifocal glasses detectives discovered that they were prison issued so they had high hopes this would lead them to their killer This was also when the FBI's San Francisco-based field office got involved, along with other agencies. They began checking lists of recently released convicts with a focus on those that had a record of sex crimes, and then they compared them to the police sketch of the suspect. This did not reveal any further leads, however. Marin County Sheriff G. Albert Hallenstein tried another angle. He sent out flyers to all optometrists in the area with the information about the glasses and the prescription. This could have been helpful, but unfortunately, the optometrist that had given a wounded man a new pair of glasses on March 9th, the day after the killing, did not see this flyer. (laughs) I know, so disappointing. Coincidentally, this was the same optometrist that Barbara Schwartz used, and they had been questioned about her prescription, but the police did not mention the unique prescription of the killer at that time. If they had, he likely could have been identified. Great. (laughs) The wounded man that had visited the eye doctors had also been questioned by police the night before about his injuries. He claimed that he had been wounded in a convenience store attack. Luckily for the perpetrator, these police were in a different jurisdiction than those involved in the Mount Tam attacks. So they were not looking for a killer at this time. (laughs) Yes, there's going to be a lot of that. It's very frustrating. (laughs) It was not their fault that they did not have access to that information, but they did fail to look into the man's story and confirm whether or not the convenience store attack had actually taken place. If they did, they likely would have been able to determine that his story was fabricated and from there find out the true cause of his injuries. I couldn't find anywhere that indicated what the wounds were actually from, but they were likely either scratches from the victim defending herself or they were from his knife, both of which would have looked really suspicious and should have been investigated further. Uh, Yeah, you don't say. (laughs) Just saying. Once again, months passed after the last killing and more people began returning to the trails. There were plenty of those that were still too uncomfortable to go back, but others wanted to prove that the parks were still largely safe. 26-year-old Ann Alderson was one of those people, and she had been watching the sunset alone in the park's ample theater on October 15, 1980. The caretaker of Mount Tam had even considered cautioning her of the dangers of being alone in the park, especially since it would be dark soon, but he decided he didn't want to disturb her. Later that day, Anne was found dead. Like the first murder, she too had been shot once in the head. 
The bullet wound was on her right side, and the gun used was a 38 pistol. Although she was found in the same general location as the other victims, there were some significant differences in this case. She had been raped, but she was fully clothed, face up, and propped up against a rock. The only thing missing was a gold earring. Hmm. Mm-hmm. It's interesting to me that he's using a different weapon every time. Because mm-hmm. he used a forty, a, what, forty-four caliber. Yes, forty-four, the and then a, and then he stabbed and a, and then a thirty-eight. A thirty-eight. Yes. It's interesting. It is interesting, and it, I mean, I won't be able to explain this very well. But in the book Mindhunter, John Douglas explains the difference between an MO and a signature, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. that's probably what he would say as the MO is how they did the killings but it doesn't necessarily have to be the same every time. A signature right. is the same every time. So yeah, his mm-hmm. MO changes, but yeah, it is interesting though. It's interesting. And I would love to know what, why he chose to change, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. I yeah. mean, the 44 worked the first time. Why would you try to do it with a knife? Right. Yeah. You know? Maybe just wants to see what it felt like. And it's then, much more personal. It maybe is much to, more personal. Yeah. But then maybe he didn't like it because he went back to the gun. Exactly. I was going to say, I don't think he liked it because he went back to a gun. So. Yeah. Interesting. Same page. Yeah. Always. Same brain. At this point, three murders have taken place in Mount Tam. Not far from there, on October 16th, the day after Anne was killed, two more were shot dead. However, this time, the victims were killed in their home, not on a hiking trail. At approximately 8.30 p.m., sheriff's deputies forced their way inside after a concerned friend requested a welfare check. First, they found the body of a man in the hallway. 22 caliber casings were found on the floor around him. It was apparent that he had several bullet wounds to the head and chest. Next, they found the body of an elderly woman in a locked bedroom. She was lying on the bed, covered by a blanket, with a single bullet wound behind the left ear. The home belonged to Helen McDermott, 75, and her two sons, Mark, 35, and Edwin, 40, had been living with her. Obviously, Helen was who the deputies had found in the bedroom, but which son was in the hallway? After they learned it was Edwin, the question then became, where is Mark? Upon further searching of the property, a small padlock door was found on the outside of the house and they forced entry. The basement was Mark McDermott's bedroom. It was dirty and smelly. Deputies found 38 caliber casings, a holster for a gun and a knife, and three rounds of 22 ammo, which is like nothing, honestly, for 22 no. ammo. Mm-hmm. Just saying, that stuff is like glitter, like it just gets everywhere. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah I, I do. <laughs> I'm glad you do, so I don't sound crazy, <laughs> but I feel like anybody that has guns know what I mean. I, uh, I do the laundry of a hunter. Yeah. Yeah, it's like glitter. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but anyways, they clearly needed to find this missing brother. He had already gotten a head start as the coroner determined that the victims had been dead for three to four days. They were able to do this by analyzing samples of the vitreous humor fluid from their eyes. Oh, and I'm sorry, I'm going to go on a tangent here because I thought that was the coolest thing ever. Did you know that that's how they can determine the length of like how long somebody's been dead? Because I, I don't know. No. I, I mean, I've probably heard a just, podcast that has said that before, but it didn't actually register in my brain of what that means. And then I was so fascinated that I went down a rabbit hole the other night looking into this. Oh, <laughs> oh God, that's so gross. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I mean, you probably do because you're way smarter than me and you have trainings in postmortems, but I figured, you know... I don't think we would use that in animals. So I was like, maybe we don't know about it. I've I've never have to uh, judge time of death. Yeah. From usually it's like, oh, that's pretty bloated. It's probably (laughs) about this time. It's been dead for a while. It's been dead. Yep. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So in case you don't know, or you know, any listeners out there aren't aware, basically they take the fluid from the back compartment of the eye behind the lens. And they test the levels of potassium, Ugh. hypoxanthine, and urea. And this can give them an accurate timeline of when the person has died, especially when used with consideration of other corrective factors, such as body weight, rectal temperature, ambient temperature, cause of death, and age. 
The vitreous humor makes a good sample for multiple reasons. Changes to the cells will occur more slowly due to it being anatomically protected and isolated by its own structure and cranial bones, which means that it can even be used in cases of severe head trauma. It is also less subject to contamination and putrefaction than other tissues. So basically, the slower the rate of chemical change, the longer we have to estimate the time of death. Fascinating. Fucking science is cool, man. It's so I love cool. That. <laughs> and I was so excited to talk about this, and I told my husband about it, and he did not think it was exciting. He's like, well, yeah, fishermen have been using that for years. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, well, you look at the eyeballs and see how long the fish is dead for. I'm like, mm, no, this is much different, not Wiley. The same. Much, did he even much listen? Different. No, <laughs> obviously not. He heard eyeballs and time of death. <laughs> and he's like, well, yeah, fish, same thing. And I was so disappointed. Not the same. There's no big giant ass needle being poked into a fish's eyeball. Right? You got your little Ugh. microscope out there? Oh, not even a microscope. A lab machine that can test the levels like of potassium. Lab and, machine. Right? Like, yeah. Urea? I'm sure. Like, oh. crazy. Crazy. It does make sense, though, that the changes would occur more slowly just because totally. of the level of protection of the skull. I'm like yeah. nodding along. I was like, yeah, I, yeah, I know. yeah, this makes sense. This makes sense. <laughs> So fun. See, we're back to anatomy. Interesting. Because <laughs> we're nerds. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> the giant then, needle in the eye, though. Ooh, yes, ooh, that ooh. part is, is not so fun. <laughs> no. Mm-mm. Everybody All right, has, back on track. Yes. We're good. <laughs> Everybody's probably forgotten about the whole Mark McDermott thing after that, so my bad. I apologize. <laughs> but basically, he ends up turning himself in. The story that comes out is that his brother Edwin suffered from schizophrenia, He would sometimes act strangely, and his condition was deteriorating. Over the past few months, Mark started referring to his brother as a thing, or an it. And he even told one of his friends that once their mother is gone, he didn't know how his brother would handle it, and someday he would have to put it out of its misery. Which I thought was so sad. That's awful. Yeah. So Mark was found guilty of two counts of first-degree murder and received the death penalty. But obviously, this is not our trailside killer, for multiple reasons. But to name the most compelling, the killings continued while he was in custody. Yeah, that'd do it. Yeah, but it was just a crazy coincidence that these killings happened Mm -hmm. right where the other murders are happening. Same timeline, also, you know, bullet wound, back of the head, evidence of a thirty-eight in the house, Mm -hmm. like, Lots mm-hmm. of crazy coincidences. But also, I found it really interesting, the presentation of the bodies, like how the brother was just sprawled out on the floor. Mm-hmm. And then the mother was behind locked door. She was covered with a blanket. Like, it was much more, yeah. like, respectful. He felt bad. Yeah, it was one bullet. Like, I just yeah. thought it was fascinating, the differences yeah. between how the two bodies were presented. But anyways. Yes. <laughs> so anyways, you guys got a little extra murder story in today's episode. You're welcome. <laughs> whoop, whoop. <laughs> It was just over a month before the killings continued, but this time, the location changed to Point Reyes Park, which is a few miles north of San Francisco. And I just want to mention, during my research, I found a lot of conflicting information about how the following events took place, as well as the exact dates. I'm going to use the information from the book Mindhunter to go off of, but I just want to mention this because if you have heard the story before, maybe from another podcast, you might have gotten a slightly different version of the story. And I'll expand on that in a, in a minute here. Can I just pause you for a sec? Yep. Um, so the space between the first killing and the second killing was six months? Yes. And then this, between the second and the third was? Second and the third. Months? So Barbara was murdered in March and Anne wasn't murdered until October. So there was a little bit of a break, like eight months, maybe? Seven months. Seven okay, months. Seven yeah. months. And then this is a month later. Yes. Yeah. So things so are picking up. They are picking up. Yes. Okay. We will definitely see that. Okay. Sorry. I just wanted to clarify. No, that's all good. It was late November when 25-year-old Shauna May had failed to meet up with two of her friends to go hiking. Two days later, on November 28th, her nude body was found in a shallow grave. She had been tied up with picture frame wire, raped, and shot three times in the head. This, of course, was already a gruesome scene but Shauna was not the only body found in the grave. Two victims were laid there, side by side, facing down. The other woman was identified as 22-year-old Diana O'Connell. It had been an entire month 
since she had disappeared while hiking with two other friends. The three hikers had started as a group, but as they went along, they all started to go at their own pace. Diana was somewhere between the two friends on the trail, but once the others had reached their destination, the girls were puzzled as Diana did not make it. They walked the trail again to look for her, but after finding no evidence as to where she had gone, they reported her missing. So yeah, he's escalating. <laughs> uh, no kidding. Yeah. She had been strangled with wire and raped as well. A pair of panties were stuffed in her mouth and her clothes were in a pile along with Shauna's. The part of the story that differs from source to source is when Diana actually went missing and was murdered. Other sources stated that she had actually gone missing the same day as Shauna, and the two women were killed at the same time. But regardless of how the events took place, we know that the trailside killer had claimed two more victims. But the day was not over yet, because during their search, two more bodies were discovered only half a mile away. Dude. Dude. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. sorry, I'm clarifying again. Yep. He didn't rape the first two victims, but he raped the second two? Correct. Okay. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Again, both victims had been shot in the head, but for the first time, one of the victims was a male. The two were identified as 19-year-old Richard Stowers and 18-year-old Cynthia Moreland. The engaged couple had suddenly disappeared and were reported missing on October 11th, which would have been before Ann Alderson's murder. Oh, interesting. Mm-hmm. At this point, Sheriff Howenstein started collecting all of the eyewitness accounts he could from those that had been in the area around the same times as the attacks. Unfortunately, with so many conflicting descriptions with multiple murders over several months, this did little to benefit the investigation. There was even speculation in the press that the trailside killings could have been the works of the Zodiac Killer. However, this theory did not hold water as the Zodiac would have claimed these murders and, of course, would have been taunting police. Naturally. Naturally. <laughs> so, with not much else to work with, Howenstein started to look for other resources to help him with the investigation. First, he brought in a psychologist, Dr. R. William Mathis, to analyze the case. Mathis said the unsub would be a handsome man with a winning personality and that he would keep souvenirs. He also suggested that anyone identified as the suspect should be followed for a week before being arrested, in hopes that they would lead police to more evidence. From these tips, Howenstein tried to set up proactive traps to catch the killer. This included dressing male park rangers up as female hikers, but shockingly, this did not help. (laughs) And I would like to see that. (laughs) I really, yeah. (laughs) Park rangers in drag? Yeah. I mean, it was San Francisco. They might have done a good job. I'm sure they would have. <laughs> <laughs> so this is when our good friend, John Douglas, from the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit, was contacted for assistance on this case. Woo, 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 woo. <laughs> Love John Douglas. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> he flew out to San Francisco to provide some on-scene input. After reviewing the case materials and the crime scene photos, he presented his profile to the Marin County Sheriff's Department. First, he notes that all of the murders took place in secluded, heavily wooded areas that blocked out most of the sky. These areas required at least a mile hike on foot with no road access. This information told Douglas that the killer was a local who was familiar and comfortable in the area. The difficult part about presenting his findings was that it challenged the profile that had been given by Dr. Mathis. Douglas disagreed that the unsub was a good-looking, charming, and sophisticated killer. These were blitz-style attacks from behind, which likely points to an asocial type who would be withdrawn and unsure of himself. If he had been good-looking and charming, he would have likely engaged his victims in conversation or tricked them with a line or coax them into trusting him. <clears throat> Ted Bundy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Bundy. <clears throat> mm-hmm. He clearly did not know his victims as they were a range of ages and physical types, and he was just waiting for an opportunistic attack. To quote Douglas, the trailside killer was non-preferential, like a spider waiting for a bug to fly into his web. Other details of the profile included a background, or a background, yeah, no kidding. (laughs) Everybody's got a background. (laughs) A bad background and time spent in jail, likely due to rape or rape attempts. There would have been a stressor before this all began. 
he was likely white, as all of his victims were, blue collar, mechanical or industrial job. Due to his efficiency, his age was estimated at low to mid thirties, pretty bright, well above normal IQ. History of bedwetting, fire starting, and cruelty to animals, or at least two out of the three. Michelle's bopping her head like, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. know what mm -hmm. that is. <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, the killer would have a speech impediment. Of course, the other detectives and police officers were quite skeptical of all of this, as it seemed like a random shot in the dark. But Douglas goes on to explain his reasoning. The fact that the killer had to rely on the surprise attack in a secluded area told him that the unsub had some type of condition he felt awkward or ashamed about. Overpowering, dominating, and controlling his victims was his way of overcoming this handicap. And the rest is just too good to not read it word for word, so I will just read a quote directly from the book here. So quote, It could be some other type of ailment or disability, I allowed. Psychologically or behaviorally speaking, it could be a very homely individual, someone with bad acne scarring, polio, a missing limb, anything like that. But with the kind of attack we'd seen, we had to rule out a missing limb or any serious crippling condition. And with all the various witness accounts and all of the people in the parks around the times of the murders, we would have expected to hear about someone with an obvious disfigurement. A speech impediment, on the other hand, was something that the unsub could easily feel ashamed or uncomfortable with to the extent that it might limit normal social relationships, yet wouldn't stand out in a crowd. No one would know about it until he opened his mouth. End quote. Douglas, I know. <laughs> it's the best. It's just so good. Ugh. Douglas went on to say he may be wrong about some things, such as age, IQ, or occupation, but he was certain on the race, sex, blue collar, and that he had some type of defect. This was one of the main points of the book where I was just blown away, and that profile is the reason why I chose to cover this case. I just thought it was incredible. I loved this part of the book. Like, we'll talk about it more in our book club episode for sure, but mm -hmm. it was just like all of those details that he could pick out just from like looking at those crime scenes. Yeah. Like, absolutely. Amazing. Amazing. Yes. Like, so fascinating how he can see into the, the killer's mind, basically. Exactly. Yeah. Totally. Love it. Yeah. Douglas returned to Quantico, and unfortunately, the killer struck again on March 29th, 1981. This time at a new location in Henry Cowell Redwoods State Park near Santa Cruz. Again, this attack involved another couple, Helen Marie Hansen and Stephen Hartel. He approached the couple and told Ellen that he was going to rape her. When she refused, the man shot her point blank, once in the head and once in the shoulder. He then turned the 38 caliber gun on Stephen and shot him in the neck. The attacker fled and the couple were left there to die. Thankfully, although severely wounded, Stephen survived and was able to give a description of the man in his 50s or 60s, balding and with crooked yellow teeth. These details made it possible to tie the suspect to a red late model foreign car, possibly a Fiat. Ballistics confirmed that this attack was linked to the other trailside killings. And crazy that he's going after couples now. Like, I just think that's I know. Wild. Like, that's ballsy. Yeah. It is ballsy to go after a dude. Mm -hmm. And just to be like, hey, I'm going to rape you. And she's yeah. like, no, you're not. Mm -hmm. And he's like, bam. And to kill her first. Like, I think I would, I know. I don't know. I think but that's usually the person who could overpower you. In almost first, all right? cases with couples that's what happens is the male yeah. is eliminated first. So then, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Very interesting. Ballsy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A new composite drawing was made and released in multiple new newspapers and on TV in order to find new leads, as well as to alert the public about the dangerous individual. Only a few days later, a woman called in to say she recognized the man in the drawing and she even knew his name. She had been on a cruise to Japan 20 years ago and said that the man had been a purser on the ship and he had given her the creeps as he was paying her daughter inappropriate attention and giving her money. Which, I mean, if you can remember a person that well after 20, 20 years, years, he was a bad person. Yeah. <laughs> and 
She's a mama bear. She, she's like, a mama she bear. Would've, she would have remembered. Like, yep. She remembered his stutter. And the man signed her daughter's book with the name David Carpenter. Great news, right? Yeah. yeah. Awesome? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not exactly. Because apparently there were too many men in Northern California with the same name. So they moved forward with the investigation. They're kind of just oh. like, oh, that sounds like a lot of work. So we're just going to try other complete things. Makes sense. That's fantastic. Like, pardon me. <laughs> I was pissed. Like, you know what I would do? I'd get out a phone book and call every freaking David Carpenter in the phone book and figure right? out who has a stutter. Let's start there. <laughs> right? Come on. Right? Make them say a tongue twister and you'll figure it out. Right? <laughs> Can I you, mean, can you read Peter Piper to me? Like, I couldn't. They'd be like, oh, <laughs> gotcha. <it's> you. <laughs> Again, not a serial killer. Don't know why I always have to say those. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it comes up a lot. Oh, well. <laughs> we talk about murder a lot. It's, it's fine. fine. Yes. So with the killer still on the loose, not surprisingly, another woman disappears. Although 20-year-old Heather Skaggs did not go missing from a hiking trail. She was a student at a printing trade school in San Jose. On May 1st, Heather told her boyfriend that she had plans to go with an industrial arts teacher from the school, David Carpenter, in order to buy a car from a friend of his. She must have felt uneasy about this arrangement because she had given her boyfriend the number and address of the man and the time when she expected to be home. When Heather failed to return hours past the time she had given, her boyfriend alerted the police. This is when the pieces started to fall together. Turns out, Carpenter drove a red Fiat, had been incarcerated for sex crimes, and had resembled the composite drawings of the trailside killer. Police also now learned that their new suspect had not shown up in their records of released inmates that they had previously investigated due to a technicality. I said that weird due to a technicality. <laughs> you didn't <don't> laugh at me. <laughs> he had not shown up on the sex offenders list as he had been released by California to serve out a federal sentence. And even though he was on the streets, the system had him marked as being in federal custody. Fuck, Carver, I hate that detail. I hate it. <laughs> it's like, how does that happen? I'm sorry, I just I, don't understand. I don't get it. Carpenter should have been caught sooner, but he had been very lucky. And since his crimes involved multiple jurisdictions, it had complicated the case. Fortunately, though, San Jose police and the FBI now had the killer in their sights. I hate that all of those details went missed, like, missed? Yeah. And he's a fucking teacher. Yeah. Like, mm, no. There's, that should never be okay. No. And there's so many times when it's just like, oh. You know, that little detail, if that didn't happen, could have caught him. Oh, exactly. could have caught him, could have caught him. But yeah, it just kept happening. But no, he's just sitting, just doing his thing. Mm -hmm. Kids. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think it was kids. It was like, I think it was like, it was very, it's a very strange situation. It's like printing jobs for like, I think it's like college student ages. But still. But still. I mean, I'm not saying it's, it's, it's good. It's in not any like they're way. tiny humans, like they're, they're That's bigger what I'm saying. humans, yes. but it's still, just they're not, kids if right. they're in school. Like, yes. Yeah. Exactly. So they questioned Carpenter about Heather's disappearance and placed him under surveillance. On May 15th, 1981, the killer was finally placed under arrest. As he begged, please don't hurt me. Oh, pumpkin. Mm, right? Mm. You poor thing. Bad for him. So bad. Mm -mm. <sighs> After this, police searched his car and his house, and between the two, they had found over 60 maps and books about local hiking trails. They also put him in a lineup and invited everyone that had made a report to participate. This included survivor Stephen Hartle. Carpenter had grown out a beard at that time to try to alter his look, but Steve didn't hesitate and picked him out of the lineup. Six out of seven other witnesses also identified him as a suspicious person that they had seen, though there were several others that were not quite certain. And I can say from experience that identifying someone in a lineup is not as easy as it sounds. So, and also these murders, some of them took place several months ago. So mm -hmm. that would be very difficult. 
at his arraignment, Carpenter's stutter was so bad, he could hardly confirm his name to the judge. And it's not like he even had to say his name. He just had to say yes. And he could hardly do so Mm -hmm. because he was not in control of the situation. Yeah. Just over a week after the killer's arrest, on May 24th, the remains of Heather Skaggs were discovered. Her body was hidden under a bush in the Big Basin Redwoods Park. All that was left on her body was an earring. She had been raped and shot once through the eye with a 38 caliber pistol. He's really found his jam with the 38 caliber. Yeah, the 38. Yeah. yeah. And so he went through the front of the head this time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If he shot her through the eye, not yeah. the back then. Yeah. It honestly went in a circle. It started with mm-hmm. execution style, right side of the head, mm-hmm. through the eye. Mm-hmm. He's getting, yeah, he's Confident. getting more brave and he's approaching couples. Like, just, it's crazy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You know, I'm like a profiler slash detective now because I've, I have read Mindhunter, so I'm like pretty much professional, and I notice details like that. <laughs> oh yeah, naturally. <laughs> I'm so smart, and I can't even speak. <sighs> District Attorney Jerry Herman was going to file charges against Carpenter in five of the murders that could be linked to his guns by ballistic analysis. He chose not to include the murders of the first two victims, Etta Kane and Barbara Schwartz as their cases lacked evidence and the weapons used did not match the other attacks. So who was David Carpenter? May 6, 1930, David was born to Elwood and Francis Carpenter in San Francisco. His mother was domineering and physically abusive. His father was an alcoholic and was emotionally abusive and neglectful. This upbringing likely contributed to his severe stutter that David that David dis- I think I have a stutter. Jesus Christ. (laughs) (laughs) All this talk of a speech impediment and I can't even speak. (laughs) So funny. (laughs) And you usually stutter when you're talking about the stutter. I do. Yeah, it's very strange. It's It's interesting. It gets in my head, apparently. (laughs) Apparently. This upbringing likely contributed to the severe stutter that David had developed during childhood. He couldn't escape the abuse while he went to school either. The kids bullied him because of his speech impediment, as well as the feminine clothing that his mother made him wear. For extracurricular activities, he was forced to participate in piano and ballet, again by his mother. He began taking his frustrations out on animals and was also wetting the bed, which of course is two out of three factors of the McDonald triad. And that's like profiled beautifully. Exactly. Mm -hmm. As he grew older, His anger turned into unpredictable, violent rage and an unappeasable sex drive, which is a very bad combination. Yeah. Not okay. Nope. At the age of 14, he had been committed to Napa State Hospital for sex offenses. At the age of 17, he had molested two of his cousins. One was eight. One was three. Mm, I hate that. Terrible. Mm, mm. He was arrested for that and served a year in California Youth Authority. This did not reform him, however, and he continued offending. When he was 25, he got married to 19-year-old Ellen Heedle, and they had three children together. It looked like he was living a relatively normal life at this point, as he had a family and a job. Carpenter had a variety of different occupations throughout his life, including a ship's purser, a salesperson, and a photo print shop employee. He still cannot control his sex drive, however, and his wife later reported that he demanded intercourse three times a night, every night. This was not enough, though, so David started looking elsewhere to quench his desires. Dude, no. No, not okay. Who has the energy for that? Uh, Yeah, I agree. (laughs) No. Nope. No. Just saying it again. (laughs) That was like Ridgeway, though, wasn't it? Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 100%. Because he had that unquenchable desire. Yes. And outdoors stuff. And yeah. There's a lot of things about this case that reminds me of Gary Ridgeway. Me too. Mm-hmm. That's funny. Interesting. Well, to be fair, we haven't really done a whole lot of serial killers. I looked back in our episodes. I'm like, true serial killers. We haven't really done a lot of. There was H.H. Yeah. Holmes, but... It has a different feel than this. And then before that... Was Ridgeway. Was Ridgeway, which is our first episodes. Yeah. So, yeah. 
they're so similar. It's, it's uncanny. Mm -hmm. His method of killing was different, but the, the details of his history and stuff are very similar. Very similar. Yeah. In July, 1960, David attempted his first attack on a woman that he had befriended. He picked her up to take her to work, but instead drove into a wooded area. Also very Ridgeway-like, just saying. So much like Ridgeway. <laughs> yeah. Totally. <laughs> he pretended to be lost, but suddenly he grabbed her, straddled her, and used a clothesline to bind her. Okay, this is getting crazy. <laughs> this is like mm -hmm. exactly like... <laughs> Wait, it's funny that I brought it up then. Right at that <laughs> moment. Yeah. He threatened her with a knife and told her that he had a funny quirk that needed to be satisfied. <laughs> Disgusting. Ew. <laughs> When she resisted, he struck her multiple times with a hammer. Fortunately, though, a military patrol officer heard the cries for help and found David's car. After demanding the attacker stopped what he was doing, Carpenter turned and shot at him, but he missed. The officer returned fire and wounded Carpenter. He was arrested and was given a 14-year sentence. His wife, who had just given birth to their third child, divorced him. As she should. The victim survived and made an interesting note about her attacker. During the brutal assault, David's terrible stutter was gone. Oh, that is interesting. Mm -hmm. Only nine years later, in 1969, he was released. He quickly got remarried and went back to his devious ways. He went on kidnapping and raping women until he was arrested again on February 3rd, 1970. In one incident, he tried to rape a woman by running her car off of the road and forcing her to get out. When she struggled, he stabbed her. But she was able to get free and, ex and, ex oh my God, and escape in her car. <laughs> How do I reword that so I don't have to say escape? <laughs> uh, it's fine. Mm -hmm. In another incident, he raped a woman named Barbara and kidnapped her and her infant. They survived the attack, and the woman even noted that he had been kind to her baby. It was later that same day that he had been apprehended. What? Weird. That's so strange. He does a lot of weird compulsive things. It seems like he just can't control himself, which is bullshit. I'm sure he can, but yeah. it's just all very compulsive. While he was waiting for his trial, Carpenter and four other inmates were able to escape from the county jail. Fortunately, they didn't get too far, and this time he was sentenced to seven years for kidnap and robbery. Not any for, you know, sexual offenses or anything like that. Huh. But, you know. He also Weird. received two more years for his parole violations. When he was released in May of 1979, he had not been listed as a sex offender. And just a few months later is when he attacked Etta Kane. That's terrible. <laughs> like, there's no reason why he shouldn't have been charged for sexual offenses or added no. to the sex offender list. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. So now fast forward back to 1981. Even though Carpenter is in custody, another set of remains were discovered on June 16th. A jawbone was found by rock climbers in Castle State Park. It belonged to 17-year-old Anna Manjavar, who had been missing since December 28th of the previous year. Many people suspected that Carpenter had something to do with her disappearance, as he would often visit her at the bank where she worked. There was not much evidence that could be used against him for this crime, however, as they couldn't even identify the cause of death. On July 31st, Carpenter was formally charged with five counts of murder for Anne Alderson, Diane O'Connell, Shauna May, Cynthia Moreland, and Richard Stowers. He was also charged with two counts of rape and one attempted rape. They also recovered the 38 that had been used in the killings. Carpenter tried to give it to a friend, but he suspected he was being set up and wanted no part in protecting a killer. With that piece of evidence in their possession, the prosecution now had a strong case. Of course, Carpenter insisted that he was innocent and continued to do so throughout the two separate trials. His first trial was set in Los Angeles for the murders of Heather Skeggs and Ellen Hansen and the attempted murder of Steve Hartle. On July 6, 1984, David Carpenter was convicted of two counts of first-degree murder and one count of attempted murder. He was sentenced to death via execution in San Quentin's gas chamber. The second trial took place in San Diego and began on January 5, 1988. 
After only seven hours of deliberation, another jury also recommended the death sentence for him, which was accepted by the judge. Unfortunately, however, a member of the jury admitted to friends that she had been aware of Carpenter's convictions for the Santa Cruz murders and concealed that fact during the trial. Judge Herbert Hoffman had to consider whether to call a mistrial and have Carpenter retried. Since he thought the evidence had been strong, it was a difficult decision. On February 21st, 1989, Judge Hoffman ruled that he believed that Carpenter was certainly guilty of the crimes, but since a member of the jury had unlawfully referred to his prior conviction during discussions, he had to order a new trial. In 1994, prosecutors tried to overturn that decision through the California Supreme Court, as the evidence for Carpenter's guilt was overwhelming. However, Deputy State Public Defender insisted that the jury had been contaminated and the trial had been essentially biased and unfair. But on March 6, 1995, the court refused to give David Carpenter a new trial as they determined it was virtually impossible to keep secrets in such cases and they believed that the four women's knowledge did not make the jury biased. So from there, they overturned Judge Hoffman's decision, which he was probably pretty happy about, honestly. Probably. He was like, I don't want to do that again. He's obviously guilty. <laughs> yeah. In 1997, the state Supreme Court upheld the death penalty for the Skaggs and Hansen murders, and on November 29, 1999, they also upheld Carpenter's death penalty from his second trial. Six of the seven judges agreed that he had a fair trial for the five Marin County murders and had been sentenced properly. He remains on death row in San Quentin to this day, awaiting appeals through federal courts. He is currently the oldest inmate there. At 90 years old. Holy crap. Like, can you just die already? Like, okay, there's 10 years from when Uh he was, from his first trial to when they upheld his death penalty sentence from the second trial. And that was long enough that the taxpayers have had to pay for him to Uh be fed and shit and public defenders and everything. And then he's still alive waiting to be executed? Which is... Not going to happen, honestly. No. They never execute people anymore anyways. He's 90. Yeah. It's insane. (laughs) That's madness. Holy crap. Yeah. Yeah, I know. (laughs) Wow. That like brought out a visceral reaction. (laughs) Yeah. I was getting mad. This is bullshit. I was like, okay, this has been 10 years. And then when you said he's still alive, I'm like, you're like, what the hell? I know. I, I was like, no, there's no way he's still alive. And I was like frantically like googling before we were recording like no he must be dead by now but no he's still freaking alive he's the oldest inmate there and he has been for quite some time because the article that i used as a reference the age that they had was 78 years old and he at that time was also the oldest inmate <laughs> so he has, he has held that title for a long time and that and he probably crazy. really likes that you know oh what? yeah probably does He's famous because not only did he kill all these people, but he's the he's, oldest inmate sitting on death row. He's apparently in Quentin. immortal. He's just hanging out on death row. <sighs> Man. Yeah. Wow. And that is the story of David Carpenter, the trailside killer. That was a wild ride. Yeah. That was a lot. I hope I didn't confuse anybody because it's a lot of like here, there, and everywhere. <laughs> no, no. You did really well. I liked it. Good. Um, my sources Archived Crime Library, The Trailside Killer of San Francisco, written by Catherine Ramsland. And I also got a timeline of David Carpenter's life by the Department of Psychology at Bradford University, Virginia. Very helpful. And of course, I used our reference book, Mindhunter, by John Douglas and Mark Olshaker. Love it. Yeah. So had you ever heard of this case before it was brought up in Mindhunter? No. I hadn't either. None of it. Not a word of it. No. I thought it was insane that I had never heard that before. Yeah. And with a name like the Trailside Killer, you'd think that yeah, that would, like pique your interest, right? Right. Yeah. Unless like maybe I had heard it, but there's so many like Freeway Killer or Hillside Killer, you know, maybe it just blended in. Blended in. Because yeah. there's so many of those in California, but yeah. Yeah. Also, I-, I hate that they give them a cool name. Like. I know. Yeah. No. Yeah. Like. <laughs> pisses me off 
You don't get to I wish I could think of a clever name right now, but I can't. <laughs> like the stuttering shithead. <laughs> Come on. Uh, yeah, I like that one. Yeah. Awesome. Well, since yeah. we're, we're back to California killers, do you want to hear my stabby story? I do. I really do. Okay. <laughs> so this was about three years ago. Um, my friend and I decided to go to Los Angeles because I had just gotten married and my husband did not at the time want to go on a honeymoon. So I was like, screw you. I'm going to take my maid of honor and we're going to go on a honeymoon. So I totally remember when you went on this trip. Yeah. It's like, we're going to make this happen. And Green Day was touring. So I'm like, got to yeah. go see Green Day in Los Oops. Angeles. Absolutely. So yes, that was our plan. That's what we were going to do. So we booked a place to stay in Burbank and we decided to ride the trains from LAX to Burbank, which is a very, very far ways away. <laughs> it, it's much further than it looks on any map. <laughs> and it was terrible. So this story happened, of course, on one of the trains near downtown Los Angeles. Not surprising. No. But um, So my friend and I were on the train we have our suitcases and we're just standing there. It's very full. There's no places to sit. So we're standing on the train and this man walks up to me and he, out of nowhere, he's just like, are you Canadian? And I was like, yeah, I am. Like, don't know how you noticed that, but yeah, I'm Canadian. And then he's like, well, are you racist? And I was like, pardon me? Like, I'm like, no, I'm not racist. I'm sorry. I don't know why you would say that, but I'm absolutely not. And it was very strange right off the bat. And then he just went straight into talking about his wife. But then he started talking to me as if I was his wife. Like he fully oh, believed I remember that story. I was his wife. But then it changed to his daughter. And he was talking about holding his tiny daughter in his hands. And then all of a sudden, I was his tiny daughter. And he was talking to me like I was his daughter. And then it kept going back and forth from wife to daughter to racist to all these things and it, I couldn't even keep track of all the crazy things he was saying and so I was just you know I was being blunt but I was being polite enough you know I wasn't making a mad or anything up you know I can handle craziness pretty well <laughs> <laughs> I would like to say that that is a strength of mine so I was just it is just very kind much of a strength of yours <laughs> yeah I was just kind of deflecting him I wasn't encouraging or him, him or anything like that but I was fine with it I wasn't uncomfortable and I could see other people on the train were looking at me like are you okay like this seems a little strange and I was like no no it's it's fine but this man suddenly got right close to me right in my face and he was yeah. like you know I could stab you right now and I said but you're not going to and he's like no, no, I won't. But I could, I could stab you right now. And I'm like, but you're not going to, you're not going to stab me. And he's like, ah, no, I'm not, I'm, I won't stab you. And it just kept going on like that. And I just kept telling him, matter of fact, no, you are not going to stab me right now. So get away from me. <laughs> and he eventually, Go away. Did. and I don't remember exactly what happened, but one of us eventually got off the train and I did not get stabbed by the man that kept telling me he was going to stab me totally remember when you came back from that trip and you were like, well, I almost got stabbed. Yes. And but it was a you good know. trip. And my friend was there who was pregnant and I was like, well, you pay attention to me. You leave her out of this. I will take mm -hmm. all the crazy here. You do not even look at my friend. <laughs> Can you, so. you like not put yourself in harm's way though? Cause I kind of like, yeah. I mean, I don't <laughs> look to be in a situation like that, but when it happens, I mean, I'm going to deal with it and try my best to not get stabbed and just deflect deflect and, prote and protect your and, friend and protect my friend <laughs> so that's how I almost got stabbed in Los Angeles I love it which I feel like I'm people that so live in Los didn't. Angeles are like yeah man that happens all that's, the time that that's what happens but you know what I'm from rural Alberta <laughs> <laughs> doesn't happen here well I mean that's not exactly true either but <laughs> Anyways. Yeah, no, it does happen here. <laughs> it, it does, but there's no trains to ride on. So, you know, no, not like, you know, and not from like trains. LAX to downtown LA and then to Burbank. It was yeah. terrible. 10 out of 10 yeah. would not recommend. <laughs> I spent like five hours in LAX and that was long enough. Yeah. 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 It's mm. not the best place. Mm -mm. <laughs> Some excellent people watching. Oh Yeah. But no celebrities. I saw none. No, I, I didn't like, either. 
I was like, where is, you know, fucking Thor over yeah. here? Yeah, <laughs> Thor, <laughs> that's what you want to see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Full outfit and everything. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, or like not. Nikki Six. Where are Ooh, you? That'd be great. Right? Yeah. Right? <laughs> oh, I would. Yeah. I would lose my mind if I saw Nikki Six in an Air Force. Oh, yeah. I, I would not be cool. No. <laughs> <laughs> No, I like to think that I would keep my cool if I saw a celebrity, but I know for a fact that I would not. I no. I would freak out. And I know this because I once saw a man tracker in person and I was too scared to talk to him. <laughs> and he's not even like... <laughs> he's not even that cool, Tara. <laughs> he's not even like a high up there celebrity. He's just from a TV show that I used to watch a long, long time ago. But I like had a little like panic attack and I was like oh my god and then I just kept walking (laughs) oh my god I love it so yeah it's hilarious yeah wow it's amazing yeah Michelle would you like a fluff and stuff question for today absolutely I would like a fluff and stuff question all right well my question today is who is your favorite serial killer oh that's a weird question. It is. Because, like, I don't, I don't want to say they're my favorite. Like, again, like, Molly As Crew in, is my favorite. Because right. um, I, I love the crew. But favorite 100%. case. Right. You know, it's favorite. It's not, like, favorite as in you support the things that they did. Because I definitely do as, not. Yeah. It's favorite as in what's the most interesting to you. Um, probably Ted Bundy. Yeah. Yeah. I just solid. Choice. I know. Yeah. It's, I know all the details. Like yes. we dove I, deep down that rabbit we hole. We went deep into Bundy and yeah. it was our first, it was our first book that we it read was. together was yes. Stranger Beside Me. So I, I got a soft yeah. spot for it. True. And, and all the Netflix things were coming out with, while we read the book and yeah. Yeah. And yeah. You know, I also have a thing for Zac Efron, and then he played Ted Bundy, which then made me feel weird about Zac Efron. And- right. <laughs> yeah, and Ted Bundy. Yeah. yeah it's very strange. Very conflicted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, That's yeah. A, a solid choice. And I feel like yeah. a lot of people are like, oh, no, I don't like Ted Bundy because it's so overdone. And it's just like, get over yourself. It's a very interesting case. Fascinating. 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 <laughs> one so, day, one day we will cover it. Ted Bundy. Yes, it we've said happen. it before. We'll say it again. It will happen. It will happen. We just don't know when. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yes. <laughs> what about you? Well, this was really hard. You know that I had a hard time choosing one, even though this is my question. Um, I think I have to go with Ed Camper, which I have a hard time saying that because he did some horrific things that I don't even know if I'll be able to talk about on an episode. They were so bad, but he yeah. is so freaking fascinating. Again, that same reason why I like Ted Bundy. Fascinating. Absolutely. And especially like reading Mindhunter, watching Mindhunter. And he's like a focal point because he was like, oh yeah, I'll tell you everything that's happening in my mind. Yep. Like, I'll talk to you. Yeah. I, that's what I love. Like, I want to know what is happening in your mind. That's probably why I would say he's my favorite because this is why I like true crime. I want to know the reasons behind the crimes. And he was like, yep, here it is. This is why I did these things. Yeah. 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 So. No. And I think on Mindhunter, like the show, he was portrayed so well. The guy that they got playing, Ed Kemper, was amazing. Oh my God. They like, couldn't have done a better job of casting. No. Wow. <laughs> like everybody they cast in that show is amazing, but Ed Kemper blew me away. Well, yeah. He, it's just so specific. Like mm-hmm. his body type just how he mannerisms, speaks like he, mannerisms yeah. is just it's so specific and he did just such a good job yeah yeah very cool so make sure to answer our question as well who's your favorite serial killer and you know what we mean when we say favorite we're not condoning murder mm-hmm. um and obviously let us know what you think about the episode you can email us at murder merlot at gmail.com find us on instagram at murder merlot podcast facebook at murder merlot podcast and twitter at murder and merlot one you can listen to us on apple Podcasts, podbean spotify and pretty much anywhere else you can find podcasts we would love if you subscribed and if you don't you're dead to me and our next full episode will be a case that of course was mentioned in mindhunter again and it is much different than the one that we talked about today so We hope you'll join us again.
Remember, if you have read the book or are currently reading the book, we want to hear from you. We will have book club questions posted on our website and social media. Feel free to send in your responses or just your thoughts on the subject in general, and we will include them in our book club discussion. Seriously, though, we would love to have some more dark and twisty nerds to talk about true crime in books with. So come hang out with us. And of course, remember to drink wine because it's not good to keep things balled up. <laughs> Bye.